There we are, Steve. We're live, man. Uh, Orvis Days two, two, or 2021. Let's see if I can talk tonight. Uh, fall streamer presentation. Uh, I'm excited. What about you? Yeah, me too. It's always a good time fishing streamers, so it's going to be fun talking about it. Cool, cool. So I'm Jason Davis, the store manager at the Orvis Royal Oak store, uh, Royal Oak just outside of Detroit. And of course, we got Steve Palmer from uh, Orvis Plano, uh, the fishing manager down there. So um, you guys may remember Steve from last spring, did a presentation, but um, talking all things fall streamer right now. So uh, kind of excited about it. So let's dive right into this. Uh, let's have some fun. So, so Steve, my question for you is why fish streamers? Why should we do that this fall? Well, the main thing is the easiest method you can possibly do. Um, it's, it's, and it's a lot of fun. You get to see a lot of visual things happen when you're fishing streamers. Um, but the biggest one, it's fun and easy. Um, you know, it's just casting a fly out, stripping it back to you and presenting it to a fish that's looking for that piece of food um, that maybe is not a nymph or a dead drift. Um, and the, the types of food and things that we're mimicking a lot of times are bait fish, crayfish, sculpins, and so forth. So it's something that is a bigger piece of food for a fish and you usually get that more aggressive um, bite or that more aggressive take and you get the visual sight of that um, and it's it's really good at just adding another tool to your quiver or to your toolbox um, another arrow to your quiver um, being able to flex and fish different styles throughout the day when the fishing gets tough nymphing is the bread and butter but that stuff doesn't always work and during the fall time um, why not throw something that's going to entice that bigger predatory fish? Sure. Um, and then, you know, streamer fishing, like I said, it's all about the attack of the fly and the visual. Seeing that big fish eat that fly um, really gets everybody excited. Nobody does not like that, right? Um, and then, you know, the tug's the drug. So we're all there for that good hook set, that strip set that really puts the hook home and um, that harder fight from some of these bigger predatory fish. So, so yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things you mentioned that another tool in your toolbox, you know, yesterday we were out fishing and, and quite honestly, we we're still at fishing and throwing indicators. Um, and it just wasn't playing the game for a little while. Uh, so one of the guys we were with switched over to a streamer and, uh, and, and hit a couple fish. Um, you know, it's just one of those things, like you said, it's while nymphing usually is the game, it'll put more fish on your hook. It, the streamers just kind of add to that a little bit, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we'll get more into some of the techniques of uh, fishing the streamers too. So some similarities there as well. Sure. And, and of course, this uh, this can be the easiest form of fly fishing, right? I mean, we're not, with streamers, we're not worried about delicate presentations of a dry fly. You know, you can kind of plop down your streamer and not have to worry about it. Um, you know, you're not worried about those sensitive little takes with a Euro nymph rod. Um, you know, it's that big aggressive pull. So, I mean, it's it's pretty easy. Uh, and like you said, we'll get into it here in a little bit. But um, but yeah, it's just so easy. Um, we we can um, we can get into it pretty easy. So yeah. So um, Jason, how do we get started in streamer fishing? What's the best way? So so you know, Steve, streamer fishing is one of those things. Uh, right out of the gate, I think anybody that's uh, starting fly fishing can get into it. You know, it, it could be as simple, really, as just taking the rod you already have, um, rigging the leader a little different, um, tying on either a weighted or an unweighted streamer to it, um, and and simply going to the river and casting it into the river, uh, bringing it back, making it look like a bait fish while you're out there. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to get started. You know, one of the one of the things that I'd recommend for everybody that's listening out there, um, if you want to get started streamer fishing, we've got water all around the country uh, that's really, really productive streamer water. Stop into your local Orva shop, wherever you're at throughout the country. Talk to talk to the fishing manager, talk to the fishing staff about about where that really good productive water is in your state. Um, I know we've got a couple places right here local that are really good, depending on the time of year. Uh, so it's, it's always good to have that local knowledge for you. Um, and, and to be honest, streamer fishing is just one of those, just kind of get out on the water and get it done. Right. It's, it's such a cool game to play. Just getting out there really, really is the way to go. Um, 
Yeah, but, and you can uh, you can catch every species on a streamer too. So it, it crosses all the markets and um go into your local orvis shop, go in there and say, I want to fish for streamers. They're probably gonna tell you what you can fish for. Um, sure. And for us, it's bass and gar and carp. I mean, we're fishing streamers for everything down here. Yeah, our, our fishing manager at the store here, he likes to tell people that, um, you know, his favorite fly is a clouser minnow, uh, classic, classic streamer pattern. Uh, but he's caught something like, it's well over 30 different species of fish. And every species that he's caught, he's caught at least one of those fish on a clouser minnow, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, it's... It, it's just that predatory strike that it, it makes it easy. Um, but you know, the biggest thing really is just getting out there on the water with a, a rod set up, like we'll talk about here in a minute and, and getting out there and throwing a streamer. So, uh, but speaking of that, Steve, um, how are we going to set up a streamer rig? You know, you got your rod. How are you going to set up? Yeah. The simplest way is just grab your five weight that you typically would fish for trout or maybe bluegill um and throw a woolly bugger on it so i mean a woolly bugger is going to mimic everything and not mimic anything at the same time so you're going to be able to catch all types of different fish on it from bluegill to trout to bass and anything in between um so take your floating line throw a nine foot or seven and a half foot leader on there um, cast it out and strip it back in um, that's going to be the simplest method um, once you kind of get into it and you start to realize that you can catch more of these fish on bigger flies um, then you can transition into something like a six or seven weight um, for articulated flies or bigger flies that are needing that line weight to cast that fly out. Um, I always, when people come in the shop and I show them some of the flies that we have for trout, you know, the articulated flies, they're always super surprised that a trout will eat that. Um, but you're usually going to catch a lot of the larger fish, but, it's, you know, I'll catch 14 inch fish on a six inch streamer. Um, they're opportunistic and they're going to go after that, that food source. So, sure. um, you know, rigging wise, usually you're going to use a shorter leader, um, something seven and a half foot, 12 to 20 pound, depending on structure and things like that. Sorry, back up one time. <laughs> um, you know, to turn over those heavier flies. So, uh, you know, adjusting things from that, you can get into poly leaders. Um, that's the easiest thing to take with you once you agree to just put in your bag you've got a sink tip there sure handy, ready to go um, maybe you're fishing some dry flies on your trout rod and okay. that just isn't working so you throw a poly leader on there which is a sinking leader that you add tippet to to get the fly down in depth um, and, and then tie on a woolly bugger or some sort of fly and that's that's one of those things up here we do that a lot you know we'll be fishing um you know, we'll be fishing the Asaba River in northern Michigan and, and there's a good hatch going on, but all of a sudden the hatch is done and it, it, it's over. Right. But there's still fish. You know, this fish are still going to feed. Um, we've got our five weight with us. We've been uh, presenting a Hendrickson or whatever is hen hatching and they're done. Uh, taking that poly leader out of your bag and just doing that loop to loop connection, getting it on there, throwing a little bit of Mirage tippet on it and, and just going to work with a woolly bugger uh you'll still catch plenty of fish it just makes you super versatile right yeah definitely yep and then having you know having other lines once you get more into it full sinking lines intermediate tips um 10 foot sink tips you know all that stuff is going to add other uh arrows to that quiver as well so you know having a full sink or a sink tip is a little bit more ideal just because it does present better it does cast a little bit better but you do not necessarily need it. Um, having the poly leader is going to get you started. And then when you get more into it, being able to control your depth and your castability with the fly line, because where that's what we're casting is the fly line to get the fly to the target. Um, mm -hmm. It is going to help a lot with that. So Steve, in the, in the Orvis lineup, if I was to come into the store and, and take a look at the, the line wall, um, when you're talking full sink or sink tip lines, what, what lines do you tend to gravitate towards down there? For us, we're typically doing bank shot lines with the, the sink tip in the intermediate or the, the type, um, was it seven? I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, like for me, for bass, we're usually bringing floating 
intermediate and the full sink, depending on the day, um, because throughout the day, things are going to change and I'll have spools with those lines on it. Um, and then, you know, we'll get into the depth charge lines. If we're fishing some lakes for striper and we got to get down maybe 20 feet, having that depth charge with that 30 foot sink tip um, is going to help us do that. Yep. And, you know, that, that's kind of the same thing up here. You know, the, those same two lines, the the bank shot with the sink on it. That's one of my favorite lines. Quite honestly, it's it's super castable, you know, with that heavy head on it. It's just super easy to roll over those big, big streamers uh, and your depth charge stuff. Some of our bigger, faster, deeper rivers up here, it, it works really, really well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're as long as you got it matched up uh, to your rod weight and you're throwing the right grain weight depth charge, um, you know, and, and it's funny because I wasn't years ago. I remember not being real adept with what grain weight to put on what rod with the depth charge line. And, um, and and quite honestly, it was before my Orvis career. And I walked in and talked to the fishing manager that was here at the time. And he hooked me up with the right the right weight to flex the rod that I had to cast the flies that I needed. And dude, they're just a dream, man. When you when you're casting them right with the right rod, the right line, the right fly, it's just it's so nice casting those lines. So yeah, that's a good point. You know, going by that shop, that local shop, and asking what line's going to perform best on your rod. You know, if someone comes in here with a super fine glass rod, and you <laughs> you throw uh, the depth chart, I mean not depth charge, the bank shot on it. Um, usually I go down a size, at least on some of those softer rods for customers and, and those people that you're going to in those shops are going to know why and the reasons to do that. So always stop by your shop and ask those kinds of things. Um, and then a stiff rod, you know, that rod, that line is going to flex it really well. Sure. Sure. So, uh, Jason, what about rigging techniques? Like, what are we, what are we looking at? So, you know, now that we got our rods figured out and, and we're, you know, we're looking at lines and rods a little bit, um, you know, uh, that's, that's convenient. That, that, uh, that question that just popped up, popped up, what's your favorite or best knot to tie on the streamer? Um, uh, right there on the screen, you know, that, uh, non-slip loop knot, um, uh, you know, I, I pulled this image out to share with everybody and, it, and it's kind of, kind of ironic because the image has basically a Rapala from a spinning rod on it. Right. Uh, that they're tying this non-slip loop knot. Um, in really a streamer, that's what you're doing. You're kind of throwing a bait fish imitation uh, similar to a Rapala or a thunder stick or something in the spinning rod world. You're kind of doing the same thing. Uh, but that non-slip loop knot provides a big open loop uh, that kind of lets that streamer move through the water really natural. You know, it doesn't... Um, doesn't get hung up and it's not like you're pulling a dog on a leash, right? It kind of lets it move in the river, uh, kind of lets it move in the river a little more freely. So that that's my go-to knot. Um, you got a cool cool image on the on the screen there of, of how that knot's tied, but there's several resources out there on how to tie knots. Uh, I know we've got, we might have a couple on the learning center on how to do that as well. So, um, but you know, leader setup, um, that's kind of one of those things when we're talking leaders while we're out there, um, you're looking at it a couple different ways. You know, I mean, if I'm throwing that sinking fly line, uh, the depth charge, the bank shot fly lines, um, I'm typically going to show throw a shorter line uh, or a th shorter leader, I should say. Um, really anywhere three to six foot, I'm shrinking that down quite a bit. Um, I always go with our Mirage, our floral carbon. Um, great stuff. You know, it, it sinks, it's really abrasion resistant. Um, it It's clearer underwater. Not that you have to really worry about that too much with predatory attacks like you do with a streamer, but uh, it just works really good to, um, to take some of those weightless streamers. Uh, I know up here, one of our big streamers is a, uh, a Hawkins Nutcracker uh, that has a deer hair head on it, a lot of rabbit strip behind it. Uh, there's really no weight to that fly. But a sinking line with a shorter leader, you can kind of move that fly through the water and it it dances in the water really well. Plus, with that shorter leader, you know, you're kind of in control. You know, it, it's going where you want it to. But, um, you know, we mentioned uh, using floating fly lines and still throwing streamers with them, which 
you know, can be done real easily. I just like to lengthen my leader a little bit more seven and a half to nine foot, depending on what body of water I'm on. And then use a fly with a bead on it or, or something like a clouser with weighted dumbbell eyes on it. Um, you get a little bit more, I feel like a jigging motion with that fly when you're doing that. Um, you know, it, it just feels like it works better with a little bit longer leader. Um, uh, you know, we got a local stream up here that I'll use that seven and a half foot floating uh, or a floating line with a seven and a half foot leader uh, with a bead headed woolly bugger. And we'll catch fish all day doing that. So, I mean, it just works really, really well. So do those same, uh, same leader uh, theories apply down on in your side of the country, Steve? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, depending on what line, like I said, we're using intermediate sinking slower one or two one to two inches per second type seven six to seven inches per second we'll adjust our leader length for that um same thing you said you know for bass if we need to get that fly down uh pretty quick right off the bank maybe they're holding in a structure we're going to tie that leader shorter because the fly is going to follow the line right sure. so that shorter leader is going to get the fly in the zone quicker um and then the opposite for a um you know, a longer leader. Um, and what we'll talk about a little bit more in, in the fly choices, um, there's some techniques you can use to kind of change that up and use different link leaders to work your flies as well. Nice. So speaking of flies, um, you know, I mean, flies are interesting because kind of the same rules apply across the country, but they, uh, you know, there's this same method of thought throughout the country on fly selection but it's one of those sometimes it always works to the rule and sometimes you've got to change things up. So, so what are your thoughts on fly selection? So first thing, there's never a dead set rule. You can do anything you want, right? Fly fishing is about having fun and getting out there and, and trying new things. Um, but some of the stuff that we've grown to uh, be accustomed to is dark flies during a dark day. Um, they're going to have more contrast and dirty water. Um, and those fish are going to be able to see them. Um, also, you know, dirty water, having a fly that has a broader head or a, a more water pushing head is going to help with that. Uh, and then during a light sunny day, having light flies and flies that have more flash. So you're just kind of mimicking those same natural characteristics of the bait fish that would be there. When, when it's a sunny day, the sun penetrates the water a little deeper. It makes those shiners and those, and those fish that have scales um, sparkle more. A dark, gloomy day, less um, sun penetrating the water, so more of just a, a silhouette of that bait fish. So that's what we're trying to mimic. Uh, like I said, there's no rules. Do whatever you want, but that's kind of the, the loose rule there. Um, so that, that kind of plays in a little bit, Steve, up here. You know, that dark fly, dark day, light fly, light day. We, we use that theory a lot with trout up here, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, is it the same kind of theory with the bass uh, down that way that you're fishing? Yeah, definitely. Especially if we get a day where um, maybe the water's a little off color, having something that's darker is gonna work a lot better typically. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, darker days, we seem to have a little bit better bite. Now there are days, I mean, I fished on uh, one of these lakes around here for smallmouth, and usually it's like white and chartreuse because there's always shad. Um, and you know, that day we threw something a lot darker olive and just was having a lot better luck with it. Um, and then as the day progressed, even though the day didn't get brighter, we switched to something chartreuse and it still played out the same way. So I always tend to stick with this at start and then I'll venture out past that if I don't get anything, uh, and change it up. Cool. cool. So other things to kind of think about, um, the speed of the current of the fly selection, you know, if it's a fast current, having a fly that gets down quicker, so a heavier fly to get through that current um, and get to where those fish typically hang out, which is with a heavy current, it's going to be on the bottom. Um, and then, you know, lighter flies for deeper slack pools and things like that. And something to kind of touch back on fly line choice. The nice thing is with flies, if you have a sinking line, but like a more buoyant fly at this point you can use a longer leader your fly line is going to pull that fly down and you can work structure so sometimes i'll cast out 
and I'll let that fly sink a little bit. I'll work it over a boulder or over a limb, and then I'll pause it and let my line pull that uh, fly down. So it looks like it's sinking in the water column or diving in the water column. And once I get past that piece of structure, I can start stripping again. So that fly is always moving and never has any pauses, meaning it's never stopping and just sitting still. It's always moving down or forward. Um, so it's something good to kind of do and think about. And sometimes we'll fish even floating flies like poppers on sink tips um, to get a different action on them. Oh, that's cool. And the There's game good. changers really come alive when you throw them on a sinking line. So oh, that's, that's a killer fly up here now. These Lake St. Clair guys up here, they're – they're all about that game changer for, especially for smallmouth. They're, you know, we've got some in the shop over here and they're, we can't keep them in stock. You know, it's just an yeah. awesome fly. So. Yeah. Cool. He's done a great job with that fly and it's cool to see him Yep, do all that with that. Um, so now we've kind of talked about flies, uh, Jason, how are we, how are we going to present these flies? What's the presentation we're going to use? So, you know, I, I kind of look at it and break it down in three different forms, you know, kind of like that that easy way to do it, um, something that's a little bit more difficult, and then a more advanced technique. You know, the, the easiest way with a streamer, and, and we do it a lot with steelhead up here, quite honestly, is kind of that 45-degree that angle cast across the stream and just let the current do the work for you. Let it swing through the current uh, until that fly drags down below you pick it up, cast it back over again, and let the current do the work. Um, you know, that's that's real effective here in the Great Lakes area for steelhead. Um, I'm pretty sure you've got, um, you know, you've got some areas down there that that swing technique works really, really well. Yeah, um, yeah the, the uh, smallmouth, if we get smallmouth in the spotted bass, when they're in the current, man, that can work really well sometimes if you just swing it past their face. Um, they don't want something moving really fast. But if it looks like it's crossing current, you'll get some bites that way. Sure, sure. And, you know, the the other way here is um, kind of a little bit more advanced, a little more work to do it. You know, kind of that straight across the stream cast and then retrieving the fly with what what they call a jerk strip method. Um, you know, I think that that term was popularized by Kelly Gallup years ago uh, when he still was in Michigan at that point. But um, that creates kind of that real erratic uh, almost scared or dying bait fish motion as it goes through the water. You know, you, you see a lot of guys that are casting a spinning rod with a Rapala, uh, and they're doing that same thing, you know, a couple of cranks and a jerk, a couple of cranks and a jerk. Um, and that's kind of the same thing you're doing uh, with that jerk strip method, which it's more work. Um, you might want to have some stripping guards on your fingers because you're, you're going to be pulling line into your finger, but um, – but it it really helps move those fish when they're uh, they're really ready to attack something. You can really get them to do that. So, um, you know, and then thinking of what I like to consider a little more advanced uh, casting presentation with a streamer. You know, a lot of our little streams here in Michigan, which I'm certain it's like that around the country. Um, a lot of our little streams, if you're wading in that stream and moving downstream you're kicking everything up, you know, you're, you're sending dust clouds and dirt and everything else down into where you want to fish. So we do a lot of upstream fishing, even with, um, even with our streamers down here, you know, they typically it's a dry fly upstream presentation, but we'll do it here on little creeks with a streamer. Um, and we'll cast upstream and bring that fly back to us at the speed of the current, or maybe a little faster, um, and, or, and just kind of let it dead drift through there. Uh, a lot of times, you know, the a little more advanced because you got to pay more attention to your um, to your line management, right? So you don't have a lot of slack line as you're doing it. But uh, some of these little tiny streams, that upstream streamer presentation, is really really effective up here. So, uh, do you guys got any smaller streams that you do that with down there, Steve? Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't do it as often, but there are some places I just off the top of my head, I fished in Arkansas, a little creek uh, for smallmouth. And, you know, I could not buy a bite if I was stripping the fly um, or if I was popping a popper across. It had to be that dead drift. And, um, you know, sometimes just even with the sinking line, throwing that line out 
with a more of a buoyant flow uh, fly you mm -hmm. can just take that slack in while that fly is slowly sinking in the surface and um, that dead drift sometimes just keys those fish in and once i figured that out and changed it up a little bit uh, i started getting fish after fish so well and and that's the thing right is you know as we're casting these and presenting these flies it's being nimble being able to change as you're going through the day right you might start out the day and every fish you hit is on the swing right you can be real lazy with it and just swing them through the current but then something changes and all of a sudden those fish won't touch a swung fly and you got to start putting some motion on it you got to get a, a little bit of a jerk strip method to it or or a fast strip uh and really burn those flies it, and it can change you know in a matter of minutes on what flies are, or what fish are really going to want to do so For sure yeah not being not going stagnant and just doing the same thing over and over again a lot of times i'll fish with buddies and and i do it too you know i get in a, a zone where i'm not thinking about it and i'm doing the same repetitive strip and maybe he catches a fish i'm going to look at what he's doing when he's stripping that fly and, and take that note and then change what i'm doing or vice versa you know if i'm catching fish and my buddy's not i'm like hey try this you know because always changing and always making things um, different, you're going to be able to learn what those fish are doing on that day because it's a day-to-day day, day -day game on that for sure. So so down there and any of the various places you fished, your retrieve speed, you know, we started talking a little bit about it. Um, what, what do you think about your changing that speed? What, what would cause you to change that speed? Um, I mean, definitely – water temperatures and then um also just visual like what water clarity things like that um and then current you know that's all going to be different things that you got to think of to change that speed up um i mean that's the three major i can think of and uh you know usually the warmer the water you can have a faster retrieve because those fish are a little bit more active they're thinking about it. that is that is something, you know, in trout world, it does get a little too warm if, it, if it's too high. But um, in the colder water, it usually slows those fish's metabolisms down. You got to fish them a little bit slower, especially on the bass side. Um, those fish are still feeding when the water temps are cold. They have to. It's just their metabolisms are slow. You got to work a fly by more fish and you got to work them slower typically. Um, yeah. And then also getting deeper, you know. At that point, if those fish's metabolisms down, they're usually hugging the banks. They're not moving around as much getting a fly weight that gets that fly in front of that fish is going to be really important. Um, <clears throat> and then big thing I've noticed, and maybe you have when we talk about is, you know, we're not trying to be delicate with these streamers. I'm slapping these things down. Same thing with a popper or anything on fishing for bass. Um, maybe that fish is asleep and I want to wake it up, <laughs> but it usually keys in that uh, predatory response. Um, I've never seen anything, you know, small fish will run from it but we're looking for those bigger fish when we're fishing streamers. Sure. I, I kind of equate that to ringing the dinner bell, right? Yep. You know, there, there are spots up on the Asabo north of us that, um, you know, a lot of those bigger fish during the day, you know, they're looking for structure to hide during the day, right? They're hiding from predators, but we'll fish the outer banks of the river and we'll take those streamers and just plop them into these holes on the side of the river and, and you'll see fish just blow up out from under a piece of structure into six inches of water that you plop a streamer into, you know, but uh, that, that fly hits the water and, and kind of wakes them up. And it's one of those, something's here. I'm going to eat it because it's not supposed to be here. All right. That's kind of the way they think. So, uh, but yeah, very cool. Cool to hear that it, it kind of plays the same game down there as it does here, you know, which is, you know, I guess, I guess that's why we're talking this, right? It's yep. the streamer game's the same every, anywhere around the country. You know, it's it kind of plays the same no matter where we're at. So, yeah, and sometimes with that bigger that plop, you'll get fish that instantly eat the flies. Like they can't resist it; just all of a sudden, it's gone before it even hits. Sometimes I see them opening their mouths. Sure. So, Steve, we got a, a question that popped up here. Um, what temp would you consider uh, cooler water? Uh, for flowing or slowing your presentation down for small leaves, you know what? What would you consider that cooler water? Uh, I'd probably say anywhere 50 degrees and below for sure. Maybe even 55, um, depending on the body of water. That's going to be the big thing. 
But once they get in that 60 to 65 range, that seems to be the really happy spot for them. And they really like to eat during those times. Um, I need to pull my thermometer out and check more often when they're really slow. Uh, most in this year, I did pull it out quite a bit and, and check some water temps. Um, and it seemed anything in that 60 degree range and above was really, really good. Anything 55 and above was okay. And below that was, you know, they're not really happy at that point for our sure. warm water species here. Trout, different, different case. Yep. And, and, you know, that's one of those things up here, you know, especially like Lake St. Clair or uh, fish and smallies there, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't, I don't know if I've ever water tempted out there. Um, I mean, it's Lake St. Clair is a giant bathtub full of fish, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of is. So I don't know if I've ever tempted it, but I've thought more seasonality and what the, what the weather's been. And I know the water's going to cool down. So, I mean, typically this time of year, we're into October, the lake's starting to cool down. Uh, it's one of those times when I know my daughter's not going to go out there swimming, all right? It's too cold. So those fish are going to start to slow down a little bit, which is when my presentation is going to slow down. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you think cold water like trout, uh, I've still caught plenty of trout in the middle of the winter uh, with snow on the banks, swinging streamers. But like you were saying, you got to really slow down, man. Those fish aren't going to put out more energy than they're taking in by eating that fish. So, um, you know, you really got to slow it down at that point. So, yeah, we fished the white this, uh, this winter, which we, I typically try to get up there and do that. And we went after our giant ice storm down here. So water temps on that river are typically around 55 degrees. And that's a sweet spot for those brown trout there. <clears throat> but when we got there, with the temps in the water, the uh, melt, the water temps were in the 46 degree range. And, you know, that made those fish not happy. We had a tough time. We still caught fish, still had a great time. But going after those bigger predatory fish, they weren't as happy to come up and eat a streamer. So it's really going to depend on where you're at in the world of what temperatures those fish might like, I think is a big deal as well. Sure. So ask your shop, you know, go into one of the Orvis shops, go into one of the local dealers, whatever and say, yeah, well, you know, I know the water temps are this. What do you think? And maybe they can set you up with the right fly. Sure. Sure. Very cool. <clears throat> All right. So um, I guess we got to figure out where we want to fish these streamers, right? What's like the, the quality of water we're looking for? Sure. Sure. So, you know, you know, thinking about it, you know, we've got bait fish everywhere. Right. It doesn't matter whether it's a little creek in your backyard or Lake St. Clair or some big stream. There, there's bait fish everywhere in the lake. Um, but they tend to, uh, in, in my observations and any of the fish surveys and that what we've done, those bait fish, they need some place to hide. Right. They, they got to hide from these predators. So they're really going to be hanging out along structure, you know, whether it's uh, boulders in the river, rock clusters, uh, logs that are submerged or trees that are down in the river. Um, you know, we went up and fished the Asabo a couple weeks ago and the kid that I had in the front of my boat was every dock on the river. Uh, somebody had a dock on the river, he was casting under docks. You know, it felt like we were flipping jigs for bass at, at one point, but uh, he pulled a couple fish, hit a couple decent fish out from under docks. Um, but again, it's structure. Um, those bait fish are living in those places for security and, and these predator fish know that's where they live. So they're, um, they're going to be there. Um, you know, the, and these fish are going to, uh, I guess, as we go through these big predatory fish, they're kind of going to feed in different locations in the river. Um, you know, we've got all this structure that they're going to be around. We know that, but those are security places for them, uh, and security places for the bait fish. So, I also like to think about like other different types of security these fish are looking for. Uh, deep pockets, uh, you know, depth is security for these fish. Um, I'm going to throw some streamers in some really deep pockets. Um, probably a weighted streamer, something I can get down there a little easier. Um, you know, if you got a big pool in the river um, where the currents kind of slowed up a little bit, um, a lot of times those fish will. They'll get out of the current, not spend all that energy swimming against current and sit in those holes. 
uh, or those pools, I should say. Um, you know, there's a couple of rivers up here that um, we got brown trout everywhere throughout the river, but then you'll get a couple of really fast little riffles that go through, and that's where our rainbow trout sit. Mm-hmm. You know, they like to sit in that really fast moving water um, in those riffles, and they'll they'll sit tucked up on the bottom where the current's not fast, and they'll just wait for something to get caught in that riffle and run its way down, uh, and they'll be real opportunistic that way. Um, you know, yesterday we were up on the Pier Marquette, and there were undercut banks all over the place that we were seeing. Uh, those undercut banks, again, are that structure, that's security for these fish. So taking your streamer and just kind of, uh, I really like doing a either an upstream cast and pulling along an undercut um, or uh, even a downstream cast and, and bringing back up along an undercut. Like say if I'm going down in the boat and I see an undercut, I'll throw right down in front of the boat and try to get a mend in to keep my, my fly going alongside that undercut and and you'll get fish that'll pop out and they'll just dart out and hit something and go back in, mm-hmm. uh, which is always cool. And, and, you know, we, we had a fishing manager that worked here years ago, uh, a really good friend of mine that he always told me, look for the bubble lines in the river. You know, that's where those fish are going to, uh, are going to sit and feed is right next to those bubble lines. Um, I kind of think of those bubble lines as kind of the cafeteria line, right? That's where, that's where the food's coming down is through that bubble line. And those, those fish, those big predatory fish will sit right outside the bubble lines, right on the edge of it and wait for something to get stuck through that bubble line and just keep moving its way through. So fish in the edge of those, uh, you know, you can really find some good fish that way. So, but, you know, I think the key is really reading your water, right? Uh, Just to determine, you know, where are those bait fish at? Where are the bait fish going to live? Um, and where are those predatory fish are going to feed? You know, it was, yeah, well, what was the line and a river runs through it, you know, it won't be too long. And I'll think like a dead stone fly or whatever it was. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of thinking like those bait fish, where are they going to live? Uh, and where is that predatory fish going to post up to ambush those bait fish? So. Yeah, and I've actually of- seen some really big fish in those outside bins um, yeah. or in, you know, where the water column is, it's really shallow and they're just laying in the gravel. And I mean, they're looking for those bait fish that are up in the shallows because they know they're protected sure. as soon as they get off that edge. And same thing with any kind of drop off or cut or front of pool, back of pool, they usually like hanging in those spots, especially the bigger fish. Um, but I've seen probably 20 pound fish sitting on one of those gravel sloped banks, um, just looking for that stuff. Sure. And that's a good point too, is like you you said about the different species. Um, different species are going to be in different parts of the water. So for like rivers here, we'll get a lot of largemouth bass in, in slack pools. Um, They don't want to be in the current as much. And then we'll get the spotted bass and smallies, you know, moving in and out of the current. So sometimes you'll, you'll have the best day for those types or those species in the current um, versus the slack water. So um, learning that stuff. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting because we've got a, a little Creek over here that, you know, it's, it's a good smallmouth stream, you know, n- not a bunch of fish that are huge by any means, but there's a lot of smallies in it. But we tend to catch the smallmouth in those faster moving sections of the river where there's a little bit more current. Mm-hmm. But if you get one of those pools or uh, deeper pockets where the water's not real fast and chuck a streamer in there, uh, you almost better hope that you have thicker tippet on because <laughs> there's probably a pike sitting in there that's going to yeah. crush your streamer, right? That pike's not going to sit in that fast water. He's just going to kind of lurk off to the side in that slower water and just wait. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. You also men- mentioned those inside bends of the rivers. Um, you know, the Asable River, um, not as much gravel as what you mentioned. There's a lot of a ton of sand in that river. Uh, but in the winter, when the water's really cold, but you get a really sunny, bright, sunny day, I've seen a lot of times that while those bait fish will sit in that shallow inside bend just because it's warmer, you know, the sun's heating that water up a little more and those big predatory fish will move in there because they know that's where the bait fish are at, Mm -hmm. right? They know that's where those fish are sitting there because it's warmer. They don't have to fight the current as much. So it's a great ambush point for them in there. So, um, yeah, 
and most of your large, large fish, like pike or a big brown or big anything, they're lazy. You know, they want to get the best meal. Uh, I can say that about any of them. They want to get the best meal without the, the least amount of work, right? Um, so, so look, man, I'm, I'm going to tell you, if somebody's got a cheeseburger, I'm not chasing them for it, right? <laughs> kind of the same down in front of you. You know, I, I'm going to wait for them to put it somewhere I can grab it. So yeah. got to think like a, a big predatory fish. But uh, very cool cool. those undercut banks is all of a sudden there's a cheeseburger or a slice of pizza right there in front of them. And now they're like, oh, I got it. Dude, it's, I'm, I, I'm on it. If I'm in that undercut, that pizza's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, Steve, what time of day or what time of year are you? uh most prone to do your your streamer fishing you know is there a specific daytime uh time of day time of the year that's most productive for you uh of course fall we're talking about this in the fall it's gonna be a great time but really year round you can fish streamers um and dusk and dawn are gonna provide those low light times um where those fish can be really anywhere and not worry about predators above them so light conditions security you know things like that that's the best place to start. If you can get out earlier in the morning as the sun comes up um, and get some of those bigger streamers, slapping them down, you're going to get a little bit more action. As the day heats up and progresses into a sunny day, maybe, um, you might get a little bit less. It might not be as ideal, but you just tweak your presentations. Maybe you dead drift a fly at that point because those fish aren't being as responsive. Um, but typically we're looking for those overcast days, dusk and dawn, um, and then, you know, any cover or shade when it's sunny. So, you know, a lot of times around here for bass on those sunny days, I mean, sometimes we have some of the best fishing, but they're in those tucked away covered spots with a tree because they're not as visible, um, to what they're trying to eat, but also the prey and the, or the, the predators above them, like osprey and stuff like that. Um, so do you guys do much after dark down there streamer fishing after dark? I've done it a little bit, not a ton. Um, a lot of the times we've done it more towards the trout side. Okay. Um, so I, I, it really does get good right before dusk. I've, I've fished in the dark um, and it, it can be really, really good. See, we do it uh, up here during the summer when we're throwing mice, right? Um, you'll get those nights where you just can't buy a bite uh, with a mouse, right? So we'll switch over and put on put on something that's going to silhouette really well after dark, you know, usually black, uh, a big black streamer of some sort tends to work really, really well after dark. Um, you know, even during our big hex hatch when, that happens up here, once that hatch is done, if you've still got three miles of river to get to the launch to get out, you know, you can either sit back with your feet up, take a nap while somebody rows, or you can chuck a streamer. Um, and I've pulled some pretty big fish after dark, just chucking streamers up towards the bank. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like those fish are obviously after dark. That's where, that's where the big fish come out of their normal hiding spots. And they're going to, going to be a little bit more prone to be in easier casting places. Yeah. Uh, so you, you can hit some of those fish a little easier with just, uh, uh, going back to what you said earlier, just kind of plopping down that, uh, that big streamer after dark and, mm -hmm. and getting those fish to move, uh, ringing that digger, dinner bell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about dark fishing, it's a good point to like, to say, you know, if you're going to fish at dark, make sure you got your casting down with sink tips and, um, heavier flies. And, uh, we'll, we'll send a couple links here. Um, some videos of Pete Kutzer, teaching you how to throw a sink tip and also the Belgium cast, um, which will help you get in that zone and be able to practice that during the daylight. So then when you go out at night, you're, you're comfortable throwing those lines cause you can't see anything. <laughs> so when was the last time you, uh, you threw a heavy weighted clouser in the middle of your back? Oh, I, it's been a while, but I, I know the last time I did it and the, the guide I was with really gave me a hard time because yeah. it was just one of those windy days, you know, it's, it's windy. I hadn't cast a real heavy streamer in a long time. And uh, we got on the river and he's sitting there rowing us down the river and I'm in the back of the boat and, and I'm casting away. And all of a sudden you just hear this big smack behind him. 
And he just kind of turned around and looked at me and, <laughs> and I've got my jacket off, taking a fly out of my back. Yeah. And he, he just kind of kept rowing. And about a half hour later, that smack happened again. And, and he turned around and he says, you know, I can fix that cast if you want me to. <laughs> but, yeah. but, and that's but, what's yeah. nice about that Belgium cast is you do that, that lower angle back cast. And when you come over front, you pop that fly way over your head and you never have to worry about it contacting you unless you get too much slack in there. But um, yeah, come to think about it, when I was just in Bolivia, I, we were throwing these nut flies and they're just, they did not want to be in the air. And I knocked myself in the back of the head with one of those. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so a little bit more on the seasons. I mean, like we said, fall for you, what, where does your fall end? Because for us, we can fish all year round. I mean, it doesn't get super cold here. Even if it does in the middle of the day, we'll just transition. During the summer, we fish early mornings, late evenings. During the winter, we fish more middle of the day. So um, welcome to how the weather is changing up here. But I guess I would say fall ends when the snow hits the ground. Yeah. Right? As soon as we've got snow on the ground, that's when I would say fall ends. Um, and once you get those first hard those really good freezes and some snow in the air. Um, that's where I would say fall ends. You know, it, it starts up here, you know, summer seems to be going later. So it used to be that it was first to September. Uh, I would consider fall fishing, but I mean, through most of September this year, we still had days up into the nineties. Right. So, I mean, it was high eighties in the nineties. So I was still considering a lot of September to be summer fishing. Yeah. Um, but once it starts getting down, those nights are cooler. The nights get down in the mid fifties. You know, I mean, we just looked before the presentation, it's 57 degrees here right now. Um, that's fall, man. Um, the leaves are starting to change. Um, I can't throw a dry fly. There's no bugs in the air. Um, and even if I did, I'm going to snag every leaf that's going down the river anyway. Um, it's the best bet at that point. Exactly. A streamer's the streamer's the way to go. And, 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 you know, those fish are bulking up for winter, right? So, you know, it's – but – Hungry. What what about when you get into winter um, up there? Are you – I mean, I imagine you're slowing everything down like we talked about, but are you still getting out fishing streamers quite a bit? It's – you know, it's – it can be really, really good streamer fishing. Um, on I like to do that in the winter and streamer fish in the winter on days where we have um, – you know, it's been cold for a while, but then we get that kind of unseasonably warm day where the sun comes out, the snow's melting a little bit. Um, the water temperature might spike up a degree or two. Um, and that's that's a lot of time enough to get the fish moving just a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's slower retrieves, man. You know, we're really moving flies slow, slow, slow during the winter. Um, a swing, a swing presentation is really, really good through the winter because, you know, that that fish is moving at the speed of the current. Um, I'm not imparting any motion on that fly really at all. Uh, I'm letting the current do all the work for me, um, you know, which is good because I can keep bundled up. Uh, I can stay warm and, and kind of make a lazy cast and a lazy swing. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it's probably the same as down there you know when those fish get cold you you're just not moving that fly very fast so no a lot of times we're fishing pretty heavy flies or we're bouncing them almost like a jig you know and you just kind of work it right in that same column of water for a little bit so yep. crawfish patterns sculpting patterns you know stuff that just gets down um, and stays down okay very cool yep. yeah and then i mean spring comes around man it's on that's one of my favorite years Oh, years. My favorite times of year. Um, those fish are coming out of that cold weather and man, they're ready to eat and get ready for, for us. Bass get ready for um, the spawn, which once those water temps hit a certain degree, they shut down again. But if you catch them before that, they're getting ready for that and they're hungry. Yep. So, so your summertime though, I mean, probably the same down there is, is up here. I mean, I know this presentation's fall streamer, but just to cover the streamer thing as a whole, you know, summertime, you know, those, those bright skies up here, uh, it gets hotter during the day, brighter during the day. Those fish are, are going to feed in the morning and the evenings. 
forget the middle of the day, right? I mean, we're mm-hmm. done. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of kind of contrary to what the winter's like here, right? You know, summer's that uh, middle of the day, it's useless, right? Those fish are hiding because it's hot. In the winter, it's just uh, going into the fall and in the winter, a lot of times it's just the opposite right. because, you know, those fi- it's colder in the early morning and colder in the evening. Those fish are looking for that, that temperature warm up from the sun coming out and that day heating up a little bit. So they're going to move, be more apt to hit during the day rather than in the, in the early morning of the dark. So, yeah, I mean, we, um, you can see a giant swing, like we'll get out in the morning and fish till it could be noon. It could be one o'clock, usually somewhere in that range, 11 to one, you'll see it just shut off. Uh, the bite goes from really good to really late or really bad. And usually it's just a couple, two, three degrees in difference of temperature where those fish usually like to hunt those bait fish and hang around the food because they're always following the food, right? So um, you can see a big difference in those temps. Very cool. So Steve, we got just a couple minutes left here. Uh, One question for you, Uh, fishing, uh, let's pick a smallmouth down there. What's your favorite rod to throw a streamer with down there for smallmouth? I'm a seven weight guy and pretty much everyone that works at the shop is now a seven weight guy too. Um, (laughs) We all, we all really enjoy the seven. The seven's not too heavy. You still get some fight. You can still throw any of the fly sizes you want typically, unless we're throwing really, really big flies, but then we're going to like a nine or 10. Um, And then, I mean, I've, it's, it's good all around rod. So you can catch trout with streamers, bass with streamers, bonefish, redfish. I mean, that's kind of my go-to rod. How about you? So, and it's funny you say that. And, you know, I hadn't asked this question before we jumped on here tonight, but you know, it, I've got a, uh, a nine foot seven weight H3 sitting in the back. That's looking to be bought here shortly. Uh, <laughs> hopefully my wife isn't watching this presentation, but uh, um, that, that's yeah. Plug your ears. Right. Um, but this is kind of that, that's kind of that go-to rod up here. You know, yeah. it's, it's a small mouth rod on St. Clair. It's uh, a great rod to go up and fish any of our trout streams for some of the, throwing some of these bigger flies. Uh, and, and, you know, the one thing I like about that seven weight is uh, typically if you, if I get an extra spool for that rod, I can run that same rod for not only fishing my streamers, but I can flop it over and use that rod for uh, fish and mice after dark. Yep. I can use it for bigger dries like our hex. Um, it's just really versatile, really versatile for us with some of these bigger flies that are up here. Um, okay. But, you know, I'm a huge fan of a nine foot five weight. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've got uh, I, I've got a couple different nine foot five weights that I've got that I like to fish. Um, I'd like to say my H3 is my favorite, but my daughter has commandeered that rod from me. Uh, that's not her favorite, but you know, she's, she's having a ball throwing a nine foot five weight with a woolly bugger on it, catching panfish, uh, crappie, ba- smaller bass. Um, yeah. You know, that rod is just super versatile to play just about any game. So. Yeah, and that new uh, blackout, the nine foot five inch, Man, that rod is sweet for everything. <laughs> like I've been, I fished it once, and it's uh, it's been really a good rod for that kind of stuff. And that eight foot five too. And uh, we'll get into another topic. We start talking about that stuff. <laughs> I know. We, well, you know, and I'm I'm not sure how many are left out there from the initial push in the stores, but I we will have them back in November, right? That's what yep. we're told. Um, but I, you know, I had an opportunity. I had a customer buy buy one of the eight foot five inch blackout rods. And we went up last week and fished the Asaba with it. That rod is phenomenal throwing streamers. Uh, Paired with the right line. um, You know, it's awesome. It casts like a six weight, but you got eight weight power. You know, it's, it's so cool to fish that. So cool. So um, any, anything for a streamer rod, I'd say anything from six weight or well, five weight. But if you want a designated streamer rod, I'd say six weight to eight weight. It's a good, range to be in very cool so um let's think here um kind of wrapped up our presentation but uh yeah. where are you fishing next i'm going down the coast next week so i'll nice. be down 
South Padre Island fishing for redfish, throwing streamers. <laughs> so, so we got a question that popped up here. Um, using an eight weight with a nine foot floating leader and a size six zonker for steelhead. Uh, what good rivers for steelhead in, in Detroit? Um, I guess that one's mine to field, right? Yeah. Uh, so in the Detroit area, we've got really two rivers. Um, you know, you've got the Huron, which gets about 50 to 60,000 planted fish a year. Um, and it gets a decent run. Uh, the other one really is the Clinton river, uh, which gets significantly less fish, but has a good run. Uh, both of those fisheries though, are a really late fall. Uh, as far as steelhead goes, I think you're in the right ballpark, eight weight. Um, I would probably use a poly leader, not a floating leader, um, just to get that fly into the current, especially into the Clinton. But, um, you know, that's you're looking probably mid to late November uh, up here. But uh, good question, though, Bob. Uh, I like that question. So, uh, yeah, poly leader is what? 12 bucks. I think yeah. It it's like 12 bucks. What do we got? Two sizes in them. Uh, three, I think intermediate fast sink and then extra fast sink. Sure. The, uh, the other thing good about those poly leaders, you can add a tippet ring on the end and then add a foot, two, three, four feet of tippet on the end really easily. I wish I would have been the guy that invented tippet rings. <laughs> they are I, that guy. I, I owe him a drink some night cause they have saved me so much not tying it's ridiculous yeah. so very cool so um any other questions uh doesn't look like i'm seeing any pop up yet so um you know i i guess the thing here uh steve is um we could leave with some parting words of you know if you're gonna go streamer fishing if you want to play this game you know it's fun it's exciting uh it can be super easy uh pop into your local shop Talk to the fishing manager at your local shop or one of the fishing fishy guys that are in the shop or gals that are in the shop and um, and they'll get you hooked up with where to go locally, what rods to use, what flies to use. Um, you know, I, I think, Steve, you would agree that we just kind of kind of hit the tip of the uh, iceberg here. You know, there's so much more with streamers that your local guy can give you help with. So, yeah, yeah I mean, we definitely just touched the, the tip of the iceberg for sure. And, and there's so much you can do on the fly tying side, all the materials behind me you can use. Um, if you get into fly tying for streamers and we have all the flies, all the leaders, the lines, if we don't have it, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get it um, as fast as possible. Then we can get you set up, but head into any of the stores for sure. And we'll be happy to help you. Sure. Is Steve, did you guys down there? I know, I think they went to most stores. Did you guys get those uh, tying kits in the store for the game changers? Yeah, we can't keep them in the store. Uh, I've got some of the popper ones now. It's sold out of the, uh, the nice. game changer ones, but we'll get some more in. Yeah, those are Easy. those are awesome. Yep. You know, it gives you all the stuff right in one one quick little packet, so you can tie some game changers. You know, you don't have to spend a million dollars to buy all the materials for that. It's just everything's <laughs> yeah. right there. It makes it super easy. So it's like tying a ton of woolly buggers and then putting them all together. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's an awesome fly too. So, you know, we've got every fly you can think of from trout streamers to bass streamers and saltwater stuff. So every store is going to be more specific to their location, um, but we can always get stuff for you. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, it looks like we're right about our hour, Steve. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was fun, man. It was fun talking. Yeah, um, sure. I had a good time and Hope everybody um, has a good time streamer fishing and come in and ask us questions because we want to help y'all. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, get out on the water. Uh, <laughs> have fun getting out on the water. So, yep. all right, guys, that's it. Fall streamers. Uh, look forward to next week. Uh, Steve, what's next week? A Euro nymphing presentation? Yes. I think, I think it's Euro nymphing <laughs> next week. So, uh, you know, get a hold of your local store. Uh, if you follow us on Instagram or follow your local store, I'm sure they'll post about it. But um, we look forward to seeing you guys next week uh, for another installment of uh, Orvis Day's presentation. So, yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, we've got some more dog training uh, videos coming up too, I think. That's right. We do have another dog training one next week. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome.
thanks guys and uh let us know if we can help there you go cool